Hello, I'm David Cairns for Radio VR in Washington, speaking now with Paul Craig Roberts, Chairman of the Institute for Political Economy, also formerly Deputy Secretary of the Treasury in the Reagan administration. He's got an important article coming out just now on his website, paulcraigroberts.org, titled, More Phantom Jobs Created, All in the Wrong Places. The upshot is that as student debt has mushroomed, it's doubled since 2007, over $1 trillion now, according to the Fed. As student debt has mushroomed, the job environment for college grads, and not only them, has dried up. And Paul Craig Roberts is identifying some falsification, or at least we'll say misleading, uh, statistics coming out of U.S. official agencies regarding the labor market. Why don't I let you? Why don't I turn it over to you? Okay, David. Yes, um, <clears throat> the BLS jobs claim for May was uh, 217,000 new jobs. If we take those at face value, uh, <clears throat> and I'll show you why we can't. Uh, those jobs uh, had nothing to do with the kind of education uh, that um, college graduates received. They were jobs for wait waiters, waitresses, bartenders, hospital orderlies, retail clerks, um, warehousemen, truck drivers. <laughs> the jobs for uh, college <clears throat> graduates were almost uh, non-existent. There were a few thousand um, for accountants and bookkeepers, there, there were a few thousand for engineers and architects, but those numbers include uh, secretaries and office managers. Uh, there were no jobs at all for law school graduates. Actually, uh, the employment of lawyers dropped. So <clears throat> if we look at them and we believe the government's numbers, we can see that there's lit validity to the reports that uh, were issued in April uh, that 83% uh, of the May graduating classes from colleges and universities in the United States had no jobs. So the month before graduation, 83% of the graduating classes <clears throat> were unemployed. And the, pay, the payroll jobs numbers, if you take them at face value, they, they bear that out. There were simply no jobs there for university graduates. Now, can we take the 217,000 jobs at face value? No. As John Williams says, uh, there was zero jobs growth in May. So how does the government get it from zero to 217,000. They do it with the use of what is known as the birth-death model and with the use of concurrent seasonal adjustment factors that vary month to month so that the monthly data are not comparable. What is this birth-death model? Well, birth uh, refers to new corporations that are formed during the month. Uh, who are assumed to employ people, and death uh, refers to corporations that go out of business that month and uh, lose, uh, workers lose employment. Where did the birth-death model come from? Well, it was a response to a failure uh, by the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics in 1983, when the Bureau predicted that the jobs growth uh, from the Reagan economic recovery was anemic. They had dramatically undercounted or underreported the jobs growth and it made the president's program and look like a failure. And of course, this was a great embarrassment to those of us in the Treasury who were responsible for the program. But the data comes out of the Labor Department and the Commerce Department, not from the Treasury. Well, it turned out that they had made an error, and so to prevent future errors, what they do, they add every month 64,000 jobs to the reported job statistics. Now, during a rising, growing economy, 
um, you can make a case that, that there are more births than deaths. That is, more new startups employing people than uh, firms failing and laying off workers. Right. So, but in the kind of economy that we've had since, since uh, 2008, makes no sense whatsoever. <clears throat> and so every year, they add in these $64,000 uh, 64, jobs each month, which comes to around 760000 jobs per year, you know, around three quarters of a million. And then they have to go back in and do a benchmark revision. They have to take all these jobs back out because it's just not there. So the birth-death model adds in those numbers every month, whether they're there or not there. And in the economy, economy, kind of economy we've had these last five or six years, they're just not there. And then they use these concurrent seasonal factor adjustments that they can, they can monkey with and uh, produce jobs that aren't there. They're just hypothetical because of the way they work the seasonal adjustments. Now, the statistician who watches this very, very closely is John Williams of shadowstats.com. He knows everything there is to know about the government statistics. He's been doing it for years. And he reports that this last time that uh, the entire um, job claim was simply phantom. It's not there. They don't exist. These jobs were not created. Mm -hmm. And that is compatible with what the conference board issued. The conference board the, the other day said, look, uh, the, job, uh, the job market is flat. There's no demand for jobs. So if there's no demand for jobs, then clearly there weren't 200,000 in May, 200,000 in April, and so forth. So that is the problem uh, with the statistics. Um, <clears throat> it, it came about, at least the, the birth-death model came about, as I said, because they had underestimated the uh, jobs created by the Reagan recovery. And this had embarrassed the, the uh, administration, almost led to the repeal of the program, in which case uh, stagflation would have come back and so forth. So, <clears throat> that's where the birth and death model came from, and it would work in a normally growing economy, or it would be okay, it would more or less work. It doesn't work in the kind of economy we've had since uh, 2008. I noticed some data which is harmonious with your interpretation, highlighted by an economist, Dean Baker, today in an article in Truth Out titled, Why Do Coal Mining Jobs Matter So Much More Than Jobs Lost to Trade? is reacting to um, attention being given to the plight of uh, or the labor market in the coal industry, where it's only about 80,000 workers. He says, uh, going straight back to your theme, that in a Commerce Department report, the trade deficit has been going up. He says, I'll quote him, the average trade deficit over the three months from February to April was running at an $85 billion higher annual rate than the trade deficit over the prior three months. This means other things being equal, $85 billion more of the demand generated in the United States would be creating growth and jobs in other countries rather than the United States. This loss of demand would translate into roughly 700,000 jobs. This is the result of having consumers and businesses switch their spending from domestically produced items to goods and services that we get from other countries. It's not exactly the same thing as you're saying, but we're leading to one similar conclusion that there is no job growth, two, that it's likely to perhaps, well, should I assume it's going to be accelerating if uh, demand is going elsewhere, if the U.S. isn't creating jobs in the country, those jobs are elsewhere, our money goes out there. Is that about where we are? Well, as I've been reporting for the entirety of the 21st century, it's the offshoring of U.S. jobs. You see, it's not that we're losing these jobs to uh, more competitive countries. These are jobs that the American firms themselves move offshore so that the American firms, what they do is they close down the employment in the uh, manufacturing factories in the United States and lay off the workers. And then they go over to China or Indonesia or somewhere and they reestablish the plant and they hire that labor at a fraction of the American cost. 
and the difference. But you see, the technology is the same. The business know-how is the same. The only difference is the labor cost is far lower. And so this makes the profits go up. And so the shareholders are happy, Wall Street's happy, and the managers are happy because they get performance bonuses. So most of those foreign-produced products, well, let me put it this way, at least half of the foreign-produced products that are coming in are the products made by American firms who close down the operations in the United States and move the production offshore in order to raise profits by lowering the labor cost. Now, what this does, it destroys, as time passes, it destroys the American consumer market because <clears throat> the American workforce becomes unemployed. Instead of working for $20 an hour in a manufacturing plant, you work for $7 an hour in a fast food <laughs> shop. And so they're killing the American consumer market. And this is the reason there's been no growth in the median real family income for a couple of decades. Because the good jobs, the high value added jobs, are moved offshore. And this leaves the American workforce uh, either unemployed or taking very lowly paid, unskilled uh, personal service jobs such as waiters, uh, bartenders, uh, hospital orderlies, and uh, retail clerks. And in order to keep up consumption, Americans on average are piling up more debt. That includes <laughs> students that just see as you were speaking, CNN just threw up a graphic that the average student debt of graduate now is $29,400. 71% of graduates have it. Um, I think we're looking at a long-term structural employment crisis. You've delineated some of the major features of it. I'm looking forward to talking to you more about solutions and if there is a silver bullet. But for now, let me thank you for joining us, uh, Paul Craig Roberts. Any other comments? Uh, uh, David, uh, I think that the long-run consequence is going to be that the demand for education in the United States is simply going to fall off because it doesn't pay. Uh, these kids build up this debt, but they can't get a job good enough to pay off the debt. And that's the situation. That is on the horizon, and I'm sure there are many families going to be weighing up the likelihood or the uh, risk and reward of taking on, what, $29,400 average debt for the shot, the possibility of getting a job that will reward that expense. Um, again, we'll be looking at this as time goes on. Uh, hopefully the future will brighten up uh, on the horizon. Uh, thank you, Paul Craig Roberts. Pleasure talking to you, David.